it's such an honor to be here as a part of this panel. It's wonderful to see all of you here, and especially for me to see so many of our law students here this evening. I think that a long time ago, when I took a public speaking course in high school, I was told, you're never supposed to begin by apologizing to your audience for what you're going to say. And I'm going to violate that here. I was going to start by apologizing that I've never learned how to use PowerPoint. <laughs> Perhaps more important, I want to apologize that my task is, I think, more limited than the prior two speakers. I want to focus on a relatively narrow question, and that's what's the First Amendment protection for rap lyrics? Also, I'll apologize in advance for the conclusion I'm going to come to. I don't think I'm going to be able to tell you as a matter of a conclusion what most of you want to hear. I'm not going to be able to tell you under the First Amendment that rap lyrics can never be used as evidence. The conclusion, I think, under the First Amendment is that only in limited circumstances can it be used, and even those circumstances are very troubling. I want to address two questions for you this evening. First, are rap lyrics protected by the First Amendment? And second, if so, does it violate the First Amendment to use rap lyrics as evidence at a trial? In terms of the first question, are rap lyrics protected by the First Amendment, if the answer to that question is no, then obviously there's no problem in using them as evidence at trial. If rap lyrics are unprotected by the First Amendment, then those who write them, form them, could clearly be punished under the First Amendment. In fact, what the first speaker, Sharice, was talking about was how there's an attempt to criminalize rap lyrics themselves. Here I want to argue to you that rap lyrics generally are speech protected by the First Amendment. There have been many efforts by prosecutors some of which have been described, to have rap lyrics punished, rap artists punished, arguing their speech is unprotected expression. And these efforts have consistently failed. The Supreme Court has said that there are some categories of speech that are unprotected by the First Amendment, and that the government can prohibit and punish speech in those categories. And the question is, well, do rap lyrics fit into those categories? One category of unprotected speech is incitement of illegal activity. There is no First Amendment right to engage in what we regarded as inciting somebody to go break the law. And there have been attempts to try to argue that what at least some rap lyrics are about is inciting people to break the law. You might have remembered, and this is some time ago, when there's a song called Cop Killer. And the then Attorney General of California, Dan Lundgren, said that if anybody killed a police officer after using the song, they would prosecute the record company for doing it. And the answer is no. Even if that tragedy would happen, it's not incitement of illegal activity. The Supreme Court in the late 1960s said, in order to rise to the level of incitement, it has to be shown that the speech had a substantial likelihood of causing the illegal act and that the speech was intended to cause imminent illegal acts. Well, you can't show that somebody who wrote a rap song intended that those who listened to it go out and cause crimes. There have been a lot of efforts to try to hold the media liable for people, say, copying what they've seen or following what was said. There was a lawsuit brought that involved a made-for-TV movie that was shown on NBC, Born Innocent. It was Linda Blair. And it depicted, though not graphically, a rape with an inanimate object. Some boys watched that movie on TV and then went out and tragically committed that crime. There was a lawsuit against NBC. And NBC was held liable in the trial court, but the California Court of Appeal said, no, you can't hold them liable for incitement because you can't say that their speech was intended to go out and cause that crime. Or there was a suit against Warner Brothers for the movie Natural Born Killers that after some people watched the movie and went out and committed a murder, the prosecutor decided to go after Warner Brothers for the movie. And ultimately what the court said is, no, you can't hold the movie company, the producer, the writer liable for incitement because they didn't intend to cause that effect. So I don't think it's possible to hold rappers liable on the ground that their speech is incitement. Another theory that's been used to use a category of unprotected speech is obscenity. The Supreme Court has said, at least since the mid-1950s, that obscenity is speech unprotected by the First Amendment. And there have been efforts to use obscenity laws against rappers. You might remember, and this is some time ago, Two Live Crew, 
was prosecuted and convicted in Florida under an obscenity law. The album Nasty as Wannabe had lyrics that were certainly profane, violent, misogynistic. But the Federal Court of Appeals overturned that, rightly saying, it just doesn't meet the test for obscenity. In order to be obscene, the material has to appeal to the prurient interest, has to excite lustful or lascivious thoughts. Hard to say that that album, and I've read the lyrics, would be said to excite lustful or lascivious thoughts. <laughs> it has to be patently offensive, and it has to be without serious redeeming artistic, literary, political, or social value. At the time of the trial, it had sold two million albums. That's some indication of artistic value. There were certainly experts who came and testified about the artistic value, especially within the African-American community, and the Court of Appeal said it couldn't be deemed obscene. I would say that that would be true of rap music more generally, as well as in specific instances. If it has sufficient artistic value, it couldn't be said to meet the test for obscenity. A third category of unprotected speech are true threats. The Supreme Court has said that there's not a First Amendment right to make true threats, and that fits with the example that was mentioned. Now, the Supreme Court has said very little in terms of defining when does something arise to the level of a true threat, but the lower courts are fairly consistent in saying, would a reasonable person perceive this as a threat? There's certainly no right to threaten somebody else. There's no right, true speech or a hoax, to call and say, I'm threatening to blow something up. The question is, from the perspective of a reasonable person, would this be regarded as a threat? Now, the danger here is the cross-cultural one that the other speakers have pointed to, that it could be the boasting, the exaggeration, the hyperbole of rap would be perceived in a different culture by judges and juries who are not familiar with rap music as a threat when it's not there. But the Supreme Court has consistently said true threats are not protected by the First Amendment. And it seems to me rare that you'd be able to find rap music to meet the level of a true threat, causing a reasonable person to believe that there was an actual threat being made. You might think of some other things that could be categories of unprotected speech. What about the fact that rap music so often uses profanities? The Supreme Court has been clear that generally profane and indecent speech are protected by the First Amendment. If you've ever studied free speech law, you might remember the case Cohn versus California. A boy was in a courthouse in Los Angeles with a jacket on his arm, and on the back of the jacket were the words, fuck the draft. The boy was convicted of disturbing the peace, and the Supreme Court reversed the conviction. In an eloquent opinion that's relevant to what we're talking about today, the court said, to censor words is to censor ideas. The government can't cleanse the English language to please the most squeamish among us. And of course, what I think this case says about rap music is that often transgressive speech has a uniquely powerful character. How else could the boy so powerfully express what was in the back of that jacket? Certainly, make love to the draft doesn't say the same thing. <laughs> Fornicate the draft doesn't say that. The use of the profanity expresses it. Just as in rap music, profanities express things that no other lyrics could express in the same way. So the fact that there's profanities there certainly doesn't make it unprotected. What about the fact that there is a violent character to much of the lyrics that we're talking about today? It might surprise you to know the Supreme Court has said that violence is not a category of speech excluded from First Amendment protection. Obscenity has no First Amendment protection if you meet the test. But the Supreme Court repeatedly has said that violent speech is protected by the First Amendment. There was a Supreme Court case just a few years ago called the United States versus Stevens that involved a federal law that made it a crime to sell, distribute, or possess depictions of animal cruelty. It was geared towards the so-called animal snuff movies. Um, and the Supreme Court, eight to one, declared the law unconstitutional saying violent speech is protected by the First Amendment. Where there was a case a couple of years ago that affects many of you, um, it was a California law that, well, not anymore, but when you were younger, that prohibited the sale or rental of violent video games to minors under 18 without parental consent. And the Supreme Court, seven to two, declared that law unconstitutional. And the court, in an opinion by none other than Justice Scalia, said violent speech is protected by the First Amendment and children have First Amendment rights under the Constitution. 
So the fact that there's violence within the rap lyrics isn't the basis for excluding them from protection. So in answer to the first question I posed, I think it's clear that generally rap music is speech protected by the First Amendment and that efforts to criminalize rap lyrics violate the Constitution. But now I come to the second and the harder question. Does it violate the First Amendment to introduce rap lyrics as evidence at trial? Here I think the answer can't be a never, and the answer certainly can't be always. I think that the answer has to be contextual, and then I think what the burden on all of us is, whether, whatever our field, is to think through how to operationalize when limited circumstance might be permissible and identify the circumstance where it's impermissible. But let me show you why I come to that conclusion. To start with, the fact that it's speech doesn't keep it from being introduced as evidence against somebody who's being prosecuted for a crime. Speech can be used as evidence against people. I mean, take the most obvious example. Somebody goes into a bank and says to the teller, give me your money or I'm going to blow up the bank, and then gets prosecuted. And the person says, well, I really didn't have an explosive device or a gun. It was just speech. That will lose as a defense. So don't try it. <laughs> um, the fact that speech doesn't matter. But let me put it in a much more appealing context. What about hate speech laws? Um, many jurisdictions, including California, have laws that say that if it's shown that a crime was hate motivated, it will get a greater punishment than the same criminal behavior if there's not proof that it was hate motivated. Um, the leading Supreme Court case was a case called Wisconsin versus Mitchell, um, where some individuals watched a movie and then they went and beat up somebody. And while they were beating them up, they expressed hate. They say they were doing this out of uh, 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 racial hate. Um, and when they were prosecuted under the hate crime law, they said, well, you can't use the statements that we made as evidence against us because you're punishing us for our speech then. The Supreme Court unanimously upheld the hate crime statute and said, even though it's speech, it was uttered at the time of the crime, and it can be used to show hate motivation. It doesn't violate the First Amendment to do that. So there is no First Amendment bar in using speech as part of a criminal prosecution. Second, rap artists can't be prosecuted and convicted for crimes committed by others. If somebody listens to rap lyrics and then goes out and commits a crime, even imitating what's described, I think that would clearly violate the First Amendment. That's why I talked about in the context of incitement, cases like Olivia N versus NBC, the Born Innocent case, or the Natural Born Killers case, where the courts have so consistently said, it can't be that just because somebody copies what's done in a movie or a TV program or a rap song, that that makes the performer or the producer liable. But third, confessions are admissible. Admissions of guilt can be used against an individual. If somebody says to the police, I committed this crime, that too is speech, but obviously can be used. If a person says to a loved one or a neighbor or a classmate, or a cellmate, I committed this crime. Those statements are admissible against the individual. Now, the hard question with regard to rap music is, is it a confession or is it just a boast? Is it fiction or nonfiction? If it's fiction, then, well, it's not really a confession. But if it's an admission to what was done, then it can be used against the person. That's a question of fact. That's inevitably a question that the jury is going to have to decide. The jury, assuming it's the trier of fact, is going to have to resolve, is what's said in the rap song really a confession or is it fictional? Is it a boast? Should we have concerns that the jury may be of a different race, different culture than the defendant? Of course we should have concerns. But there's no way to keep the jury, the trier of fact, from having to decide, is this or is this not a confession? Now what finally I want to say is what can't be done is to use the content of rap songs as evidence of character or criminal proclivity against the defendant. And it seems often that's what prosecutors are trying to do. Generally in criminal trials, prosecutors are very limited and generally prohibited from introducing evidence of a criminal defendant's character or proclivity. 
you can't use the fact that somebody committed prior crimes as evidence to prove that the person did this crime. You can't generally say, look at the books that somebody read, or look at the trouble this person got in before, and that shows the person has a bad character, or that shows the person has a proclivity to commit a crime. In the law of evidence, this is generally not admissible because it's said that it's so prejudicial against the criminal defendant, it outweighs, to use the legal term, any probative value. And I believe that when rap lyrics are used to show proclivity, character, they certainly should be excluded on the grounds that the prejudicial impact on the jury far outweighs the probative value. And I think that the burden then is on judges to very carefully separate why the rap lyrics are being used, allowing them in only for a very narrow purpose and excluding them for other purposes. I say this realizing that it's not the ideal conclusion. The best conclusion is always a bright line rule. Never allow it in. The First Amendment would always be violated. But I think I can tell you, and here I'm the messenger, courts aren't going to come to that conclusion. Courts aren't going to say that this can never be admitted. So I think what should emerge from this is much more careful thought of how do we limit the use of rap lyrics to the very narrow circumstance where we admissible as evidence and keep it out in all other instances and how do we take account of the context which should make it so prejudicial, especially in a cross-cultural context. As we talk about this, it's important to realize that the law is often behind society. You might not realize that early in the 20th century, the Supreme Court held that movies were a form of expression not at all protected by the First Amendment. And so the government had no limits on its ability to censor movies or require prior approval of movies. And it wasn't for decades until the middle 20th century that the Supreme Court finally found that movies were protected by the First Amendment. And then when television and radio developed, the Supreme Court allowed far more censorship over those media than in any other context, giving the government much more ability to regulate, say, indecent speech over television and radio than it would movies, books, or anything else. Well, I worry that the law is also lagging behind with regard to rap music. And I think that's what you're hearing today with the examples. And I think one reason why it's so important for our law students to be aware of this is it's only with awareness of this that we can try to provide much more First Amendment protection for this relatively new, this relatively emerging, but very important form of speech. Thank you.